Thank you so much, Christy. And boy, don't we have a lot to be thankful for today. I mean, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one, as the old hymn says. And we could all do that. In fact, it might not be a bad idea over the next uh, days of this week coming up to maybe write down some things and say thank you, God, for it. You know, I have a tendency when I write it down, it just means a little bit more to me. Isn't anything wrong with writing God a letter, is it? Just sit down and write him uh, something special that uh, he's meant to you and been to you. So I hope you have a good Thanksgiving. This isn't a Thanksgiving message this morning, but I promise you it's a, it's a good message. Uh, hell, anytime you talk about heaven, that's pretty good, isn't it? And, and uh, we're going to look at that a little bit more uh, today as we go along in these uh, messages on the book of Revelation. We have two more messages that we'll bring uh, from the book, and then we'll start our Christmas series of three messages entitled, All I Want for Christmas. Well, reckon what I want for Christmas. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you in three messages, all right, and it won't have anything to do with toys under the tree, I can tell you that, but uh, there are three things, I think, that all of us, I believe if we just sat down and thought about it, there are things we would all want to be a part of our lives for Christmas. And so we'll, we'll talk about that toward the last three Sundays of uh, this year. But uh, today, I want to bring this message to you from the first five verses of the Revelation 22, a message entitled, Strolling Down Heaven's Main Street. John is coming to the end of the vision that God gave to him on the island of Patmos. And it is interesting to me that the way the book of Revelation closes is that it closes with a vision and a view of our heavenly home, the New Jerusalem. I was thinking about it as I was reading these verses of Scripture this week. What an encouragement these particular verses must have been to the old man of God, John on the island of Patmos. Just remember where he is. He's on a deserted old island. He's in a very dismal, discouraging, and defeating place in his life. He has been banned to this island because of his stand on the Word of God and his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And while there in that deserted, discouraging place, God does something to the old apostle John that must have been a real blessing in his life. He gave him a vision of things to come, and not only a vision of things to come, he gave him a vision of the new home that one of these days all of God's people are going to enjoy. Now, I think this not only was an encouragement to John, I believe God gave it to us as an encouragement to us as well this morning. You know, I think maybe God looked down through time and realized that one day we'd be a little weary, weary down here in this old wore-out sinful world. And we might need a little encouragement. And so what God does in these last chapters of the book of Revelation is He paints for us a magnificent picture, just drops that picture down in our hearts. And one of these days when you're kind of having a bad day, when you're just not feeling your best, maybe having even a little pity party. Anybody ever have one of those, a pity party? Hey, I think all of us have had one of those, haven't we? Well, here is a picture right here in the Bible that God has left us to encourage us when times are hard and the way gets difficult. And I want to study this passage of Scripture with you a little bit today. I call the message strolling down heaven's main street. As I read these five verses of scripture, it occurred to me that John is focused on heaven's street. You'll notice in verse number two that it says, in the middle of its street and on either side. And he begins to describe what's on either side and what's going down the middle of this street. I believe this is heaven's main street. I believe heaven does have a main street. You say, well now preacher, are there other streets? Well, I guess there probably are other streets in heaven, but I believe God wanted us to have our focus on this main street. You know, cities are, are known for their streets. Did you know that? Uh, well, when I think of Atlanta, Georgia, you know what I think of? Peachtree Street. 
uh, when, when, I, when I think of New Orleans, Louisiana, where I went to school, I think of Canal Street. Now, y'all thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? <laughs> oh, boy, didn't I fool y'all? I saw, I saw that all the way. And it's Bourbon Street, absolutely. I remember the first time when I was going to school in New Orleans when Daddy, I had a short week, and we were coming back for the holidays, and he decided that he'd go with me. And I had an extra bed in the room, my little dormitory room, and, and so he went with me. And I said, well, Daddy, we got to go to Bourbon Street. And he said, well, okay, let's go to Bourbon Street. I won't ever forget it. And when we come out, he said, you know, you need to, you need to be loaded like uh, Marshall Dillon to come down here <laughs> on, on Bourbon Street. But uh, quite an experience for an Owasa man to go to Bourbon Street. But cities are famous for uh, their streets. And when we get to heaven, one of these days, we're going to go down heaven's main street. Now the Bible doesn't give us the name of heaven's street, but it does give us a magnificent description of heaven's main street. And some of the things that we're going to see when we take a stroll one of these days down heaven's main street. I, I, I don't know about you, but I've kinda, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to that stroll one of these days. Could you just imagine? Maybe you've visited some places and, and gone to some pretty special spots while you've lived on this earth. But could you just imagine, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I've had a difficult time over the last several weeks trying to comprehend what I've been preaching to you. I really have. I mean, I've been trying to see it in my mind. I, I've been trying to comprehend it. I've even been hunting words to use to describe it to you as I've tried to describe what John describes for us that one of these days we're going to be able to enjoy. Oh, one of these days God's people are going to stroll on an enjoyable trip down Main Street in heaven. And we're going to learn some things this morning as we stroll down Main Street. Some things about our heavenly home. You see, John is still on that tour that the angel is carrying him on. Remember last Sunday? The angel told him, come follow me. And, and John went. And, and that angel is, is giving John a guided tour to the new heavenly home that one of these days all of us will experience. We're still on that tour, and today we're strolling down Main Street, and there are three things about our new heavenly home that I want you to learn this morning. I want you to look at verses 1 and 2, and I want you to notice, first of all, what I'm calling the life of the city. The life of the city. The life of our new heavenly home. I found it interesting as I read these verses this week that two times in these verses of Scripture, the Bible talks about life. I found that interesting. In fact, that's the reason I gave this first point, the life of the city. Notice verse 1. It says, He showed me a pure river of water, of what? Of life. It's clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then in verse 2 he says, In the middle of its street, on either side of the river was the tree of what? Of life. So you see, the city that one of these days you and I are going to live in, the city that you and I are going to enjoy, it is a place of life. I find that interesting. And what I find also interesting is the source of the life that is going to be enjoyed in the city that one of these days God's people are going to live in. And I want you to notice two things that produce the life of the city. This city has life in it because of two things. One, because of the river that flows through it. And we're going to talk about that. And then also because of the tree that grows in it. So you've got a water that's flowing through it, you've got a tree that's growing in it, and those two things are the life of our new city. Let's look at them for a few moments. Let's start with the river in verse 1. I want you to notice this river that flows through the city of God and right down Main Street. Now, when I was reading these verses of Scripture this week for the first time on Monday morning when I read the verses, and then that afternoon I wrote them out as every week I do. And it, you know, it just occurred to me, these things sound a little similar. In other words, it's almost like I've read this before somewhere else. 
And you know what? The truth is I have read it somewhere before, somewhere else. You see, these verses of Scripture take us all the way back to the very beginning. They take us all the way back to the book of Genesis. They take us back to the opening chapters of the Bible. They take us back to a place called the Garden of Eden. And there in the Garden of Eden, there was a river flowing through it and there was a tree growing in it. Isn't that amazing right there? I, I just thought, hey, this sounds so familiar. You see, ladies and gentlemen, what God taught me this week is this. What Adam and Eve lost because of sin, Jesus Christ, one of these days, is going to restore to the people of God when we get to heaven in the new Jerusalem. So let's think about this river for a minute that is flowing through it. And there are three things about the river that I want you to notice today. I want you to notice, first of all, the sanctity of the river. The sanctity of the river. Now notice a word that he uses to describe the river in verse 1. He says, and he showed me a what? A pure river of water of life. It is a pure river. It's not a polluted river. You realize we live in a day of pollution. Did you realize that? We live in a day where things are not as clean as they used to be. You know, when I was a boy growing up, we drank from about every stream there was around here. Did you know that? But today they say, well, you better watch that. Isn't that right, Jerry? But not drink from every stream. You just don't know what's in it anymore. You don't know about pollution anymore. I found it interesting. I didn't try to remember the statistics, but I found it interesting that, that you know, produced water sources uh, 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 are account for about 70 to 80 percent of the intake of water that we drink today. In other words, there aren't very many of those old-timey wells around anymore. You know, there are these city systems now because of pollution. And there, there are uh, money that's raised from year to year to provide wells in various places around the world so that people have clean drinking water. But isn't it good to know that one of these days when we get to heaven, you won't have to have any environmental protection system going on up there. They'll be out of a job because everything is going to be pure. In fact, it's going to be crystal clear. Man, get you a drink of that water in a glass, hold it up, and you can see it through and through, and it'll be the best drink that you ever had in your life. Isn't that going to be something? The sanctity of the river. It was pure. But notice not only the sanctity of the river, I want you to notice the source of the river. Notice that verse 1 tells us where, where the source is. It says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding where? Where is it coming from? From the throne of God and of the Lamb. There's the source of the river. Kind of reminded me of Ezekiel's vision of that millennial temple in Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel got a picture of the millennial temple and he said there was a flow of water coming out of it. And he said it's coming out from under it and it's coming past the altar. Well, where was the water coming from? Coming right out of the Holy of Holies, ladies and gentlemen. That's where it's coming from. Coming right from God himself. You say, well, what's the point of all of this? Well, you know, I, I kind of wondered that myself when the Holy Spirit was teaching me this this week. And then he showed me the point of it all. I never thought about it. I preached through Revelation before, but I'd never seen this tree. What's so special about the river and the water in the New Jerusalem? But do you know what exists in Jerusalem today? No water system. Do you know what existed in Jerusalem in the days of Jesus? No water system. There wasn't a river. Jerusalem wasn't located on a river. You know, some, some cities locate on rivers because of a water supply. Montgomery, Alabama, where is it located? Alabama River. I mean, Baton Rouge or New Orleans, where are they located? Mississippi River. See what I'm saying? But the city of Jerusalem was not located on a river, and it had to depend on cisterns. You know, the Bible talks about cisterns. It had to depend on cisterns to collect its water, and even King Hezekiah... In, uh, in Chronicles had a tunnel and he tunneled water into the system. But isn't it amazing? 
One of these days in the new Jerusalem, in a place where there is no water, there is going to be an ever-living, everlasting, ever-flowing, never-ending water supply that is made by God Himself and comes from the very throne of God. That's the source of the river. You see the sanctity of the river. You see the source of the river. And then there's the significance of the river. What is the significance, preacher? Well, notice what he says about it in verse number 1. He says, He showed me a pure river of water of what? Of life. Now somebody says, well, now, do you believe it's a literal river? Is it a literal river or is it a, just a spiritual river? Well, I think the answer is yes. That's the answer. I think it's both. Oh, I think it's a literal river. I believe one of these days when I get to heaven, I'm going to literally be able to see the river flowing down heaven's main street. I'll be able to hear the river flowing down heaven's main street. I'll be able to taste the river flowing down heaven's main street. Get me a drink of the river flowing down heaven's main street. You know, not so long ago, I'd come down here, and I'd, I'd been here at the church and for, for a service, and I was going back home. And as I headed back home, Kenny had been had some things, Kenny Gorham's going on, and I said, well, you know, I, I want to go by and see Kenny on my way back home. And, and as I was going that way, I, well, Miss Jackie Skipper's right there on the road where Kenny lives. Oh, I said, I'm going to stop by Miss Jackie's and, visit with her and then go on down and visit with Kenny a little bit. And, and I, had, I, I was thirsty that day. I'd come from a service here and I was just thirsty. And I, you know, I hate to just barge in on folks and ask for something, but man, I was just thirsty. And I asked Miss Jackie, could I have a drink of that good well water? She's got some good old well water still in Garland, Alabama. And, I, and she gave me a glass. In fact, I got more than one glass. I got two glasses of that good old well water. And you know, I got to thinking about that this week. I don't know why God brought it back when I was reading these verses of Scripture. But one of these days, I'm going to heaven, and when I get thirsty, I'm going to get a drink of water that's going to be better than anything I ever tasted down here. Isn't that something? Don't you have something to look forward to? God providing for the needs of His people. There's a river running through it. It's going to be a literal river. But I believe this river is not only just a literal river, I believe it's also a spiritual river. Kind of reminds me of the conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Remember that story? She came to a literal well, didn't she? And she wanted to draw literal water out of that well. And Jesus told her, you can draw that water out of that well if you want to, but you'll thirst again for drinking that water. But if you just understood who is standing here, you'd ask Him and He'd give you a drink of water that would come flowing up out of your innermost being. I'm glad I've had that drink of water. How about you this morning? I'm glad I've had that spiritual drink of water. And one of these days we're going back to a special place and flowing through that place will be the water of the river of life. I want you to notice next, not only the river that flows through it, but the tree that grows in it. Verse 2 says, In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding <clears throat> its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Now let's study the tree for a second. Three things I want you to notice about it. First of all, I want you to notice first the record of the tree. The record of the tree. Because the Bible gives us a record about this tree. This isn't the first time this tree is mentioned in the Bible. I won't ask you to turn to it, but you can go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 9 talks about a tree that grows in the Garden of Eden. In fact, it talked about two specific trees in that passage of Scripture. There was the tree of life that was growing, and there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, remember? And God said to him, you need of every tree in the garden. There's no prohibiting of any tree except one tree. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you know what Adam and Eve did, don't you? You know, they took of the forbidden fruit. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's what happened when they did. They then understood good, but they were powerless to do it. They also understood evil, but they were powerless to avoid it. And so here they are now 
sinners, understanding good and evil, but unable to resist or to do either. And then what you know God did? God restricted them from a tree. And that was the tree of life, remember? Lest they eat of it and what? Live forever. And you can read about that in Genesis chapter 3. Had they eaten in that state and condition, they would have lived forever as sinners. Never been an opportunity for them to be redeemed. That's the record of the tree. But then I want you to notice the return of the tree. Because now in the New Jerusalem, the tree of life that was once in the Garden of Eden has returned to the New Jerusalem and you can just eat of that tree all you want. You know why? Because we're going to be in that glorified, resurrected body. We're going to be in that perfect, eternal state and you'll be able to eat of this tree. That, that's the return of the tree. In fact, this week when I was studying my Bible, it occurred to me that you can study the Bible around three trees. Did you know that? You can study it around three trees. You can study it around the tree that's found in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life that God planted in that garden. And we know that tree remind us, reminds us of sin. That man sinned and disobeyed God. But oh, thank the Lord, there's another tree mentioned in the Bible. And that's the tree called Calvary. Acts chapter 10 talks about Jesus hanging on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24 talks about how Jesus Christ bore our sins in His body on the tree. And so that's the second tree that's mentioned in the Bible. The tree in the Garden of Eden. The tree on Calvary's hill. And then there's a final tree. And that tree is right here in Revelation 22. And it's the tree of life the record of the tree, uh, the return of the tree, and then the reasons for the tree. Why does God plant this tree? Why does He allow it to grow? And why does He allow it to spread to either side of the river? And there are two reasons. One is for nourishment. For nourishment. I'm glad we're going to eat when we get to heaven. Aren't you glad? Hey, thank you for that amen. I like, I like eating. I do. And, uh, and I'm glad we're going. You say, well, now how do you know that, preacher? Well, just, just look at what the Bible says. Don't take my word. Look at what the Bible says in verse 2. He said, the tree of life, it bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. You know, we're coming to that time where some of these folks are selling fruit. I always liked that. Last year's fruit was so good. The apples were just delicious. The oranges were just good. You know, I, I just, don't you like, I like fruit. I like peaches. I, and, you know, maybe ever, ever, you know, ever, there'll be a peaches on the tree growing by the river uh, of life and the street of heaven. And, boy, peaches are good. But better than peaches is peaches in peach cobbler. Amen? <laughs> kind of get an amen on that. And I don't know if they'll have bluebell up there, but brother, I know if you put it on it down here, it's amen and hallelujah right there. But th th I mean nourishment. God has provided everything that we'll ever need or dream of when we get to heaven. Not only nourishment, but for healing. You notice what it says in verse 2? The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. I like what O.J. Vernon McGee said. He says, here's God's first aid kit right here. The healing of the nations. You got a little need physically? Just run to the tree of life, ladies and gentlemen. Get those leaves and there are healing properties in the leaves of the tree of life. This is the life of our new city. Now the second thing I want you to notice is in verses 3 and 4. In verses 1 and 2, we find the life of the city. In verses uh, 3 and 4, the liberation of the city. Now notice what he says in verse 3, right off the bat in verse 3 he says, and there shall be no more curse. Now let's pause for a second. There will be no more curse. Sometimes people say, well preacher, I just can't understand why things are the way they are. Well let me explain it to you. Things are the way they are because of what happened in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago. Remember, it all started perfectly. Remember? Perfect environment, perfect world. God put man 
and woman in the garden. And that's how it began. Yes, there was the opportunity to say no or yes. They chose to disobey God. And the Bible, you go back to Genesis 3, and the Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned, it says God cursed the earth. In fact, he dealt with the devil in Genesis 3, 14, when he said to him, on your belly you'll crawl, cursed of all the beasts of the field. He dealt with the woman in verse 16. And he prescribed her punishment. He dealt with the man in verse 17. You know, before that, he hadn't had to work too much for things to grow. You know, I, th I, th I think what happened, and this is my thinking, so understand, this is H-E-B, that's Herbert Ellis Brown. This is H-E-B, okay? I, I think before Adam and Eve sinned, I think things just grew naturally and beautifully and easily. I think after they sinned, it flipped. And the things that we don't want to grow now, they just grow naturally and beautifully and easily. I'm talking about all them weeds. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You got to fight them. Well, you know what? That's what God told Adam's going to happen. Thorns and thistles, and you will battle them, and you will fight them for the rest of your days. Oh, but listen. One of these days when we get to heaven, there will be no more now let me, let me tell you quickly. Let me tell you what, what it's going to mean, what it's going to be like to live in a world with no more curse. And there are three things these verses tell us it's going to be like. Number one, in this world with no more curse, we're going to be able to serve Him. Look, look, look at what it says in verse 3. And there was no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Now, the, I, I, don't, I don't know all that that means. Can I just say that first? I don't know everything that means, but I know that what I can understand from my study of the Bible about heaven, we ain't going to be sitting on a cloud plucking on a harp. That just wouldn't be too entertaining to me. Maybe for about 10 minutes, but after that, that might get a little bored. Oh no, we're going to serve him. Do you see that? Now, I don't know all that that's going to mean. Assignments perhaps that God will give us that we'll be able to do and carry out. Maybe, maybe God will give us stewardship of some places in the new earth that he creates before the heavenly city comes down. But we're going to be able to serve. I'm looking forward to that. You know why? Because I, I serve him in a flawed body down here. I serve him with physical limitations down here. I serve him with mental limitations. I, I try to do the best I can from week to week uh, being a good servant of his. But you know what? I fail. Don't you feel that sometimes? Don't you feel failure sometimes in how you try to serve God? And yet one of these days when we get to heaven, it's going to be perfect and there'll be no more curse and no more residual re effects of sin will linger around and we'll be able to serve Him and not even get tired doing it. Isn't that going to be something? We'll, we'll be able to serve Him. We'll be able to see Him. No, notice what this verse says as he continues on in verse 3, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve Him. Verse 4, they shall see his face. We're going to be able to see him one of these days. Isn't that going to be something? See the face of God. Be able to look upon the one who died on Calvary's cross for you and for me. We'll serve him. We'll see him. And then we're going to be able to show forth him. Now, now notice what the verse says in verse 4. He says they'll see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. Now, Right now, there's an inward mark we have. It's called the seal of the Holy Spirit. But one of these days, somehow in heaven, there'll be an outward mark. And everywhere we go in heaven, it'll be the visible reminder that we belong to Him. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you His today? Are you His? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus today? If not, our prayer is that you'll do it before the service ends. 
So you see the life of the city, you see the liberation of the city, and then finally the Lord of the city. The Lord of the city, verse 5, says there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The Lord of the city. Who's the Lord? Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God, the King of kings. He'll be crowned Lord in this city. But I want you to notice something. Listen carefully. Back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible makes this statement. It says He's washed us in verse 5. And then in verse 6 it says, and He has made us kings and priests. Now you know what that means? That means that not only is Jesus going to reign, but you and I are going to be able to reign alongside Him when we get to heaven. Now, let me explain to you what this reign is going to be like. First of all, it will be a reign in light. Do you notice what He said? There will be no night there. That's twice that the Bible's mentioned that. In this chapter, back in chapter 21, it mentions it. No, no night. There'll be no night. Just light. No darkness. You know, sometimes bad things happen at night, don't they? You know, sometimes when you're going through a hard time or when you're sick, it's like the night is the worst of it all. You ever notice that? I had a call not so long ago, about 2 in the morning, and... Uh, little family said, Preacher, would you, would you come to the house? And, and I said, I will. And I got up and I got ready. And I went to the little house and I went inside and there laying on the bed, I knew him, there laying on the bed was a man about six foot two. But cancer had robbed him of his strength and reduced him to just bones. And I sat down by the bed and he looked up with tears streaming out of his eyes and he said, Preacher, he said, would you just please pray for me? He said, I'm hurting so bad. And he said, the things that they're doing aren't helping very much. He said, would you just pray for me? Would you just pray that the night will soon be over? And you know, I prayed for him. And I held his hand and I listened to him as he prayed and he begged God, please let the morning come and the night be gone. Hey, one of these days, there's going to be no more night, ladies and gentlemen. There's going to be no more bad news when we get to heaven's glorious place. It's going to be a wonderful place. We'll reign in light. But not only will we reign in light, we'll reign in longevity. Notice what he says in the latter part of verse 5. And they shall reign, how long? Forever and ever. Longevity. Reign forever and ever. Oh, we're going to get to reign with Jesus when he comes back during the millennial reign for a thousand years. But you know what? That's just going to be a tune-up compared to what's going to happen one of these days when we go into the new Jerusalem and we reign forever and ever. Look, a thousand years when that starts won't even be a tick on the clock in eternity when we get to heaven. You know, I tried to describe heaven the best I know how. And I'll be honest with you, last Sunday when I walked away, I felt like I'd done an inadequate and insufficient job. And this morning, I, I've tried to do the best I can. Kind of feel like the little boy who was born blind. And he was blind for about 10 years of his life. And one day, his mama discovered a surgeon that had developed a particular procedure of eye surgery. And there was a possibility that he could receive his sight. So they took him to the doctor and the surgery was performed and he came back after the surgery. The doctor took the gauze off of his head and took uh, the patches off of his eyes. And he said to him, he said, Now son, open your eyes. And he opened his eyes and immediately the doctor could tell the way he was squinting that he could see light. And then he said, Open them a little wider. And he did and he began to focus. And the first face, obviously, that he saw was the face of the doctor who had done the surgery. Then he looked to the right and there was the nurse of the doctor who was helping him. And he looked to the left and for the first time in his life he saw his mama and tears were streaming down her cheek as she realized that her boy could see. 
he got up off the doctor's table and he walked over to the window and he opened up the curtains and he looked out. And for the first time ever in his life, he didn't just see the sky, he saw the beautiful blue sky. And he just didn't see the grass, he saw the gorgeous green grass. And he saw a precious little rose and, and he just didn't see a rose, he saw the ruby red rose. He saw things we take for granted every day. And then he turned to his mama and he said, Mama, why didn't you tell me everything looked so good? And she said, Son, I tried to, but you just have to see it for yourself. And you know, I wonder. I wonder one of these days when eternity begins and we're all in heaven. And maybe you're strolling one day down heaven's main street and you're in looking to the left and you're looking to the right and you're, you're seeing all the glories of your new home and you look up and see somebody coming and, and as, as a, that person gets a little closer, you'll say, well, that's, that's old preacher Brown down there. I says, who that is? And you'll come up to me and say, well, now, Brother Brown, why in the world didn't you tell me how beautiful everything was going to be? And I'll just maybe say, you just have to see it for yourself. Isn't it something? Our precious new home. But you know the question this morning? The question this morning is, are you going to stroll down heaven's main street? That's the question. A man was going to a particular destination and got turned around. He stopped and asked for directions. And the guy told him how to get to where he needed to go. And after he had finished giving him the directions, Here's what the guy who was receiving the direction said to the guy who was giving it. He said, sir, is that the best way to go? The guy looked at him and said, it's the only way to go. <laughs> and could I say to you this morning that there's not a best way or better way for a person to get to heaven. There's only one way. And Jesus gave us that way in John 14, 6 when he said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. And if you want to go to heaven, you've got to follow Jesus. It's the only way. Would you bow together with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement of this message. Lord, not only has it encouraged, I believe, your servant, John, when you gave it to him, it's encouraged me this week. And I believe it's encouraged us today. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in this room, those listening and watching, have made that all-important decision to follow Jesus. If not, I pray that today would be that day. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.